Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Chess Comic Books 26, in which we take a serious look at the light-hearted world of chess. Today I want to look at books from Hungary, or involving Hungarian masters and so forth. Before I do, I have to say thank you very much to Lance Bark, who's been kind enough to give me the thumbs up. And secondly, to explain that we won't be doing anything to do with the Polgars today. It's not that I've forgotten them, not that I'm belittling them, it's just that they are a study in themselves and I decided to keep it on one side. So chess comedy books number 26 begins. Here we have the daddy of so much and so much, the very restrained Mr. Lyos Portish. This book came out when my colleague Paul Lamford was working at Batsford's and he explained it was extremely difficult to know what to do because they hadn't really bought out a book like this before and they weren't certain how many would sell or how popular it was, if indeed it enjoyed any popularity at all. Portish uh, was still alive, but, but uh, he was a very strong player, probably about number three when these such things were stated. Um, outside of the Soviet Union, probably behind Fischer and Larson, or maybe ahead of Larson. He was, uh, this book probably was printed in Hungary. As a result of this, the diagrams are a little bit funny, but quite frankly, once you've started to read it through, I don't think that really would stand in your path of enjoyment. Uh, it, it starts from 1956, a very significant date in Hungarian history, if I know anything, and goes through to, I think, the 70s, uh, 1976. Uh, Portish was a very dangerous player during all of that time and would play on board one for the Hungarians. So there he is. A book I quite uh, rate. Um, but it, 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 he was never a ball of flyer like someone like Shirov. He was just a consistent performer, competitor, if you will. Now, the next one is by Stephen Davis, as it's published by McFarlane of the USA. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know anything about this at all. Um, Lip Schutz. He, um, he played in the 19th century, he played in America, but he was for the benefit of ourselves today. He had a drop of Hungarian in him. He was born in the Kingdom of Hungary within the Austrian Empire on the 4th of July, 1863. And his name was Samuel. And he seems to have been shipped over to America pretty early on. Pretty early on. The first few games are played in the Manhattan Chess Club. And then in 1886, we you know what Steinitz was getting up to, he came across to England and played against Gunsberg, who was probably hiding inside Mephisto or something, he jumped out and said, all right, let's have a game then. And immediately we see an example of the Evans Gambit. I'll give you an example of how fine the engravings are. Here's one of our old mate Zuckertolt. I'm sure you will agree with me that the print quality in McFarlane books is very, very high. And there's enormous references to contemporary writers. And they also do little bits of update. He became state champion, so he went back to the US. Um, it's a winner. It's always difficult if there's an opening which has subsequently been given a name, but at the time wasn't called that, then 
so they've sort of called it a regular opening and then in brackets and with a rabbar index collet system our friend Lip, Lipschutz, Lipschutz lost a match against G.H. McKenzie well that's no disgrace there we are look that's the final score a little chart there we are now this is a very very fun hardback book it's a little no about a little known player and here he is many years later playing against Lasker in a Vienna well, that Vienna, in the Vienna Open there see that well, Stephen Davies, I'd like to thank you for a very scholarly book, which I haven't yet, doesn't mean no credit, but I haven't yet really looked through at all. Very detailed synopsis of his results. Um, some additional games, examples of newspapers which he's consulted, a hundred newspapers. Other books he's looked through. Index. Games, he's, he played a lot of games against Delmar and also A.B. Hodges, who we'll come on to discuss at some point. And Mr. Hannum, James Hannum. Now, you do know Hannum's name from the Philidor defence, don't you? Yes, you do. Well, there we are. It's a nice book. Um, an unknown quantity for us. Now, I had a problem. I have many problems, but, but I had a problem. I needed to find out whether I should be covering Retty's games uh, and Retty's life. Obviously, I've got several books by Retty. Retty, because I think we should be pronouncing that. So I don't say it that look like that. And here's an example. It's quite interesting dust cover as well, if you actually are a bibliophile. Now, there it is. Modern Ideas in Chess. But you may notice the night has been printed on top of page uh, some text which doesn't seem to make the slightest sense. In fact, the text is in French. It was uh, in an effort to save money during the war, I think. And it has a new introduction by Harry Gonbeck, and it's a bell. It was written in 1942. So there we are. And it deals with um, almost the philosophy of chess. Uh, he centers on various players and various games, not too many. Um, his chapter, Americanism in Chess, was something I read through, uh, unable to understand what he was talking about. You may have more uh, luck than I did. Um, this is an example of the relaxed way that the publication is put together i.e. single column and light notes the comments are very worthwhile um, and it seems to go up to after the, the first world war um, Boglibov Rati um, yes 1919 um, and then there's this work would not be in would be incomplete, did it not? And there's another novel. It's like Shakespeare's unkindest cut of all. The work would not this work would not be incomplete. Did we not mention this master, who is not, so to speak, direct, directly related to the newest school, but whose style of play shows a close relationship with that of the youngest masters? Well, and it is that well-known pudding, Tartakova. Or as Andrew Martin once heard, was heard to pronounce it, Tartakova. But I can't help thinking he was pulling my leg. He also gives a game by Erva. And there's an article, a bit of drum banging, I would think. When Kappa Blanca in his championship match with Lasca gave us at the beginning a very large amount of drawn games. He is said to have expressed himself as follows in the news to a newspaper reporter. 
Chess technique and knowledge of the openings have progressed to such an extent today that it might, even against a weaker player, be difficult to win a game. Well, if you don't believe that's true, a hundred years, almost to the second, that it was these words were spoken, and just you look through the recent, recent games that appeared online or the uh, upcoming second half of the candidates, and you see whether he was right. Symbolism in chess. Chess has afforded writers on occasion for the suggestion of every kind of symbolism. I can't even understand what that means. I should like to add here that the Americanism of Capablanca's play shows itself in a milder, more attractive garb, probably, as was the case with Morphy, by reason of his Latin ancestry. Well, if you can understand that, good luck. And if you agree with it, bad luck, because it sounds to me like a load of rubbish. But there we go. I know it was uh, Professor Murray in his history who said that schools of thought, as applies to geographical areas, after the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, scarcely apply, and possibly they don't. Nowadays, they definitely don't. But there we are. It's a very nice book. Um, yeah. Of itself it, it it looks slight but um i like it we stay now with retty it's a larger book again a lovely old bell isn't that a beauty look at that look at that this is the sixth printing of the book and it's been translated presumably from hungarian and it was first published in 1933. And it said he was born in Czechoslovakia. Well, I thought he was born in Hungary. Well, of Hungarian ancestry anyway. I know when I met Martin Blaine, who was Hungarian, he called him Righty. Anyway, he gives a history of chess. Uh, 1862, he begins with a Fort Bear counter gambit, and he goes right through to a giving a game by Nimzevich. Pretty well known game. You'd find it somewhere else, but with these notes, it's particularly interesting. If you don't know Masters of the Chessboard, I don't know where you've been, because you should. He's talking about Alakine, the present world champion, was born in Moscow. Well, there you are, that dates it, 1933. Yes, he was about to lose his title to Erba, and then he went back again. And then he drank himself into oblivion. Well, I forgive him that. There's no photographs, but there's a fair few diagrams. And the format... It's very detailed, but I wouldn't describe it as crowded or messy. I would describe it as just like old fashioned and that's appropriate. Here we are with the third of the bells. Again, slightly more nicer a cover. Ratey's best games of chess. Whoa, it again. Richard Bretty was the author of two of the finest books on chess, Modern Ideas in Chess, tells you so, and Masters of the Chessboard. This is by Harry Gollenbeck. Harry was an international master, although his ancestry was in Eastern Europe. Don't, I'll take that no further. He was nevertheless a quintessential Englishman. This book was written in 1954. And I dare say, Harry put a lot of work into it. Chess, like literature and the arts, often suffers a premature loss. The poems that Keats and Shelley might have written, the music that Mozart and Schubert might have composed. Well, I happen to know, I know little about Schubert, to say the least, but Mozart did an enormous amount of prodigy, didn't he? And was pushed to death, almost more so than Ryshevsky was over the chessboard. Anyway. The music that Mozart and Schubert might have composed, these have, counter, these, these have their counterparts in the missing games due to the early deaths of uh, such masters as Charusek, Karusek, I never know how to pronounce that, Breyer and Wrighty. 
Brea and Retty to you and I. And uh, he thanks various people, including the legendary EGR accordingly, for all the help they've given him. Which is really good. Um, he doesn't. He doesn't thank John Nunn, and I'll come on to explain why. There are 70 games here. I've got a loose page. I bought this on from eBay, and the young lady, because it was a library copy, took out a page of the library, and it, correspondingly, the book. <laughs> Rather like banging on a wall and something on the other side falls down, one of the little pages became detached. But never mind. It really is beauty. I'll just give you a flavour of it there. As you can see, it's quite orderly. This is an eloquent eulogy. Now, the world coming in line as it is. He's ready again. I would think he looks fairly content. And it's by that very well-known player, Harry Because they couldn't even spell Harry Gollenbeck's name correctly. There we are. Well, if you want to learn how to spell it, you should go to the uh, Hastings Chess Club. And then you can climb up, up the hill. And there's a ch there is a seat by the horn-type sports place where we where we played um and also there is one uh, in chalfon st giles where uh, harry lived john upham knows far more about this than i do i'm only copying what he told me there it is it says improve your chess by studying the games of of the all-time deepest thinker well we wouldn't have known what he was thinking in a way had he not written it and having written it we can still today, 80, 90, 100 years later, draw upon that. This has, I think I'm right in saying, footnotes by John Nunn, who wasn't the biggest fan of Harry Gollenbeck. For example, John adds, it seems to me that White retains very good winning chances. They're not that intrusive. They only come once every so often. However, it does not allow White a number of checks and the move played is safer. This is a terrible blunder, loses by force. And John continues for about 20 lines. Harry didn't question the move at all. If you have any interest in doing some, it's between Wrighty and Astolos. I've actually got a book of Astolos's games. I should have got that out, shouldn't I? I had it with me in my luggage when I was in Tunisia for the Millennium Celebrations. I had an accident in the swimming pool. I fell over. Um, I shouldn't have done. I wasn't even, it was just, I just slipped in the showers. And it took me about nine years to recover from, from everything that, which followed it. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you this was I had a book of Astolos's games with me. So I sat in the chair, you know, terribly unwell, and uh, played over them. So here is Mr. Astolos playing against Retty. This wasn't the book I had with me. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I, I just mentioned that in case you wanted to see what John's update was. See if you can spot it yourself using the old book. And then you could come to the nun text and say, oh, yes, I see what you mean, John. But you could disagree with him. He wouldn't mind that. But what he would mind it is if you disagreed with him but didn't explain why. And last, but by no means first, chess Olympiads. This is, a, I should explain that the Olympiads are the chess Olympics. And these are held... Uh, when we can manage to do so every two years and they are team events this uh, goes from I think about 1927 yes the first Olympiad which was held in London in 1927 and goes through to something like 1968 or 1970 let's have a look oh no this edition only goes through to 64 there are editions it's by Foldiek there are editions that go through later um it gives, I'll show you the statistics. It gives a page of statistics like that. That shows you how they got on. 
and the various scores and percentages. It splits it up, wins, draws, loses, losses. Here's an interesting game. I'll benefit anyway for our purposes. Between Jonathan Penrose and Vasily Smyslov. Penrose played the Goring Gambit against the ex world champion. Um, he appears to have uh, prepared pretty thoroughly. Barton quotes this in the Guardian chess book and was friends with Jonathan Penrose and with many another. But it can come as no surprise that Smyslov won the game. Probably won the game, I wonder what happened, quite frankly. Here's an example of, the, of one of the qualification groups. And these days, everything is done on the Swiss system. But in those days, you were thrown into a pot, seemingly at random, there was some seeding, I think. And then the top teams came through and went into the final. And uh, yes, it's got lots of games. Here's the famous game between Penrose and Tao. Mm. There. Dr. Jonathan Penrose, still with us. Still with us, a very retired, retiring gentleman, as I said before. Well, that just gives you a little roundup of Hungarian books. I hope you've enjoyed it. This has been uh, Chess Comedy Books number 26. I'm James Pratt. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>